Specialist here at the Iowa Arts Council. And this is Joseph Pearson, Community Resources Specialist at the Iowa Arts Council. The Iowa Arts Council, a division of the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs, is your state arts agency, and we are pleased to present Art Ups, which are learning opportunities for Iowa's artists, arts organizations, and communities. Today, we are pleased to host David Bright, President of Iowa Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts, an attorney with Simmons Perrine Moyer Bergman out of Cor Coralville. Excuse me. David is engaged in general practice, including business law, corporate law, real estate law, will, trust, estate planning, nonprofits, franchise and distribution law, antitrust and trade regulation, as well as merger, mergers and acquisitions. David is also an adjunct professor at the University of Iowa College of Law, where he co-teaches art, law, and ethics. He is a frequent public speaker on issues related to business formation, estate planning, art and museum law, as well as nonprofit profit tax-exempt organizations. David will be presenting about Iowa Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts and addressing your legal questions for today's legal Q&A for artists and nonprofits. However, before we get started, a few housekeeping items. All the lines are currently muted, and they will be for the duration of the presentation. This will reduce background noise as this webinar is being recorded. The webinar will be archived on our website for future reference, and we will send participants of today's webinar a link to the recording as well as David's contact information at the end of the presentation. David will cover legal general excuse me, David will cover general legal topics driven by the questions that were submitted by you in advance. We will also have Q&A throughout the webinar. If you would like to send questions to the presenter during the presentation, please feel free to use the chat feature on the left-hand side of your screen. Uh, as I mentioned before, you can also use this chat feature if you are experiencing any technical difficulties. Again, thank you for joining us today, and we will now turn it over to David. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to everybody on the call. Uh, I'm glad that uh, you're all able to participate today. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, my contact information will be available and we have contact information uh, as you should see uh, now on the screen um, from the Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts website. Uh, that has my direct contact information by email or telephone at my law firm, um, and both of which are basically the best ways to get a hold of me with questions that, that relate to uh, either the, the VLA um, or if, if you would have some specific uh, questions you'd like to follow up with. Um, first, I'd like to give a little background on the uh, Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts in Iowa uh, and, and a little bit of how I got connected with it, and then we can get into the specific questions that have been posted uh, so far from, from registrants, and then if people have additional questions, uh, they can use the chat function um, to post those, and I'll address those. And if we run out of time or you have a question uh, that you'd rather not discuss in a public forum or a semi-public forum here, uh, you're more than welcome to send me an email or, or give me a call. Um, to start with, the, the Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts uh, grew out of an interest in, uh, from a number of attorneys in the state of Iowa uh, who either had background in the arts, uh, were in relationships or marriages with people who worked in the arts or had been in the arts, um, practiced in fields that involved artists such as intellectual property, those types of things, and noticed that there was, um, while there's a lot of areas where people can get inexpensive legal help or certainly people can retain lawyers for representative matters, um, there was a little bit of a gap in terms of legal aid and other services like that where they could provide this type of specific uh, information. And so a number of us got together and formed uh, Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts uh, on a model that has been widely used uh, nationwide and launched the organization in around 2006 um, and just started getting going. We had our website up. Uh, we, we were starting to get pretty active and re reaching out to the community. And then uh, in 2008, the economy went a little south and, and we noticed that we just weren't seeing a lot of interest in our services, weren't getting a lot of out outreach, uh, which we found interesting because we thought at that point in time that would be when people would need more of that kind of help, but, it, but interestingly it just sort of went the other way. 
And the organization just sort of went a little quiet and dormant for a few years. And then uh, in about 2011, uh, we were contacted by Colorado Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts who had gone through a similar launch, dormancy, and then um, sort of came back and tried a second time. And, and they helped us to sort of reinvigorate the website and the social media presence, and, and we started over, not really from scratch, but um, re retooled a few things and, and reorganized and have been um, working since that time to, to do educational uh, opportunities like this one, um, to uh, provide information in terms of uh, website resources. We're going to be developing uh, some basic sort of white papers that we'll post on the site that deal with some of the issues that we'll discuss today so that uh, if people can't make these events or, or have other questions, they can review those materials and then follow up with us as needed. So uh, we've been expanding our activities and, and increasing them. Uh, since that time, we work with uh, students in the University of Iowa College of Law uh, who help us do research uh, and prepare materials for presentations and for uh, website publications. Uh, we've been doing that for about probably five semesters now and have gotten a lot of interaction, good interaction with students. And, and hopefully what we've also created there is an interest in law students so that as they become lawyers in private practice or elsewhere, that they remember that the, the services that they provided, they remember the value that it, that it created, and hopefully uh, in their practices or in their careers, uh, they continue to be involved either in our organization or similar uh, VLAs around the country, and, and they can help artists and, and arts organizations. Um, so that's sort of the, the, the summary uh, of, of what the VLA does. I, I was introduced to it um, just simply because I had worked in law school for a professor uh, who had uh, one of his focuses was on museum law and cultural institution law, and I was his research assistant and studied in these particular areas. Um, and my mother is an artist, my wife is an artist. So those things drew me uh, in sort of personally and professionally, uh, which is why I um, became interested in the VLA. And since that time in, in my practice, uh, I've been in practice for about 14 years, um, I have spent a fair amount of my time working uh, with nonprofit organizations, uh, artists, arts organizations, musicians, museums, uh, cultural organizations. Uh, so it's an area that is of interest to me both on a, on a professional and a personal basis and that I, that I try to work in as often as I can in my career. So that's sort of the, the, the basic background on the VLA. Certainly if you have questions about it or the services that it, that it offers, you can let me know. And if you have questions that I can help with, you can let me know that as well. Uh, the, on your screen you'll see the the uh, common legal topics for artists and nonprofits that we'll discuss today, uh, first being uh, copyright and intellectual property. Uh, typically for artists, um, copyright is the, the main area uh, of need or interest. Um, there are also um, trademark and patent law, which fall under the intellectual property side. Those aren't as common of a need for artists, but sometimes uh, trademarks can be uh, important for an artist or for, certainly for a nonprofit. We'll focus today mainly on copyrights. Uh, so if people have questions about those other areas, they can uh, reach out after the presentation and let me know. Second area is business organization. Um, what kind of entity do you want to form? Is it better to be for-profit or nonprofit? What are the pros and cons of either structure? Uh, the third area, um, in, in, in as you'll hear during the presentation, one of the, I think, most important uh, is contract basics. Um, a lot of what, uh, a lot of questions that, I, that can be asked or are asked in advance of this um, come down to uh, contracting, negotiating, drafting, those types of things. Uh, so as you'll see, uh, that's, a, that's an important area to cover. Uh, fourth area is liability. Uh, who's responsible when things go bad is a simple way to look at that one. Uh, and then the last are uh, tax questions. There are some, some specific questions that uh, involve uh, grants and other kinds of scholarships, but certainly we can, we can broaden the discussion a little bit there uh, as needed. Um, so turning first 
to the copyright uh, and intellectual property. Uh, the first question that you'll see there uh, is, um, are artworks inherently copyrighted? Um, to, to start with, I want to just give an overview of, of, a, of a copyright, and then I'll go into the specific answer to this question. Um, copyright is, is federal protection that's pr provided by the laws of the United States to authors of original works of authorship. Now, that includes uh, musical works, artistic works, literary, dramatic, other types of intellectual creations. Uh, it's available um, for both published works and, and unpublished works, uh, and it gives a bundle of rights uh, to the person who holds it uh, that include the following, one of which is that you can reproduce the copyrighted work in, in copies or CDs or LPs or whatever the, the medium is. You can prepare a derivative work that's based upon what's been copyrighted. Uh, you can perform the work in public. Uh, you can display the work in public. Uh, and you can also distribute uh, copies of the work for sale, for lease, for other ways. Uh, to the public. So that those rights are, are sort of contained within that bundle of the person who holds the copyright. Uh, it also might include certain rights under what's known as VARA, or the Visual Artist Rights Act, and I'll touch on that uh, after, after we go through this portion of it. Um, copyright protection, when you are talking about an artwork or really anything else that's eligible for, for copyright protection, it exists from the time a work is created in any fixed form. So if you are a painter and you make a painting and it's not in a show, it's not displayed in a gallery, it's not shown to a prospective purchaser, it's in your studio, the only one who's ever laid eyes upon it, it, it still has copyright protection. The minute it is fixed in form, whatever that form is, whatever the media is, it's protected. Um, it is immediately the property of the person who created it, the author, the painter, the musician, whatever it is. Uh, and only that person, only the author or owner of the copyright, or someone who would derive rights from the copyright holder, such as, say, uh, in the event of the death of an artist, the spouse, or one of the other heirs of the artist, uh, only those people uh, can rightfully claim copyright in a work. Uh, now, one thing that's important to note is there is some exceptions there uh, for things that are called work for hire. Um, and work for hire is essentially where someone acting as an employee, acting within the scope of their employment, um, creates a work. And generally, that work is considered to be owned by the employer. It is not considered to be owned uh, by the employee. Now, uh, there's another situation, and that involves commissioned works. So that would be a situation where you don't have an employee necessarily. You have, let's say, someone who's come to you as an artist and asked you to paint a, a painting of their children or to create a, a photograph of their home or something like that, and they, they commission that specific work. Now, there are some requirements there that um, the person who commissions the work owns the copyright if and only if they and the artist agree in a signed written contract that the work is considered to be a work for hire um, and, and or that it falls into a, a specific category. But the main, the main point of that is, is that you need to agree with someone that it's a work for hire. Otherwise, the copyright doesn't automatically belong to the purchaser. It will generally remain uh, with the artist because, it, as I said before, it's, it exists immediately upon the creation of a work in a final form. Um, so to the second question, how do you copyright, how does one copyright their work? Well, the easy answer to that is, is you, you make it. You create the work bring it into existence, it's, a, it's immediately copyrighted. Now, there is also a 
registration process by which you can register a copyright with the Copyright Office. Uh, there is not, you, you don't have to do it in order to have that copyright protection be affixed from the moment of creation. Uh, you can register it. Um, if you want to register it, um, there are certain advantages that come with that. Um, the main advantage um, for registration um, is that you establish a public record of your claim of copyright. So if you have it on file with the Copyright Office and it was on file on, say, April 1st of 2015, you know when your copyright was, was registered. You know when that protection started. Um, another advantage to having registration is that before you can file an infringement suit in court, uh, it's necessary to have something be registered. Um, so there are certain advantages that registration has. It's not necessarily something that I would discourage someone from doing, but I think oftentimes there's a misconception that copyright protection only exists when it's registered or only exists when it's granted that way. Um, and, and I think it's important to, for people to understand that that protection actually starts much sooner than those processes uh, and that protection begins much earlier. Um, the, one of the other questions about copyright, and this is not one that's, that's on the list here on the screen, but one that I think is important um, is how long that copyright protection endures. And that's undergone some changes over the years. Um, but generally, a, a good summary of it is that if you've created work on or after January 1 of 1978, um, it's automatically protected from the moment of its creation, like I've been mentioning. Um, ordinarily, uh, because of a, a, of a Copyright Extension Act that was filed, uh, work is, is given a term that endures for the life of the author plus an additional 70 years after the death of the author or the creator. Uh, works that are made for hire, the duration of the copyright is typically 95 years from publication uh, or 120 years from its creation, whichever is shorter. So if you have a specific question about when protection runs on a particular item, you need to be able to provide some, some background information as far as is it a work for hire or not, uh, if not, you know, when, when was it created, so you could determine exactly what the term is. Um, but that's one that's, that's better left for a specific conversation. So if there's something that um, someone wants to know specifically about that, uh, you're, you're uh, certainly fine to contact me and we could walk through sort of the, the calendar of the particular work. Um, the, as I said, the, the other, uh, there's other areas of this that involve trademark uh, and patents. Those are other areas of intellectual property law. Uh, not anything that I would, would plan to touch on today, but similar to a specific specific copyright question, uh, if there's something that you would want to know, uh, feel free to contact me. We have uh, intellectual property lawyers at our firm, and there are many of other ones around the state that are very good at what they do uh, who could help, so uh, we could certainly connect you with the right people uh, to talk to about those. Um, so I will take a minute here to talk about the Visual Artist Rights Act that I mentioned before, and then I, I want to move on to the, the other sections that we have. Um, the, the Visual Artist Rights Act was passed in 1990. As I said, it's commonly referred to as VARA. Um, and it addresses um, some additional rights uh, that sort of accompany copyright. And it's, it's essentially a part of copyright law. And what it does is it preserves an artist's moral rights in works of art uh, by providing protection for certain of those works from them being altered or destroyed without the consent of the artist. Um, it boils down to two primary rights. Uh, the first is what's called the right of attribution. The right of attribution permits an artist 
to either claim or deny authorship of a particular work, um, which then allows an artist to dis dissociate himself or herself uh, from any undesirable or, or um, bad changes in their opinion to the original work. Uh, so they can essentially prevent the use of their name from being associated with a work that in their opinion has been distorted or changed or modified or, 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 or say harmed in a way that they believe would be bad for their reputation, bad for their body of work, that type of thing. Uh, the second is the, uh, the right of in, in integrity, which basically allows an artist to prevent intentional changes, modification uh, of a work that they consider to be harmful to their reputation or their body of work. Um, and it's, now it's important to note that this only covers certain limited visual artworks, paintings, sculptures, drawings, uh, prints, and, and still photographs. And within those types of works, uh, only single copies or signed and limited numbered editions that, that amount to, or that are under 200 or less are actually protected. So it, as I said before, it's a narrower level of protection, but it does apply um, to to certain works. Now, it does not apply in cases where, for example, there have been natural um, changes to a work, such as um, just aging, materials uh, decaying a little bit, those types of things. It wouldn't give any protection necessarily there. Um, similarly, if it has been changed because someone has been engaged in conservation of the work, trying to protect it, um, it usually won't be included under VARA unless someone is grossly negligent in their uh, conservation. So if someone really makes a terrible mistake and mishandles something or damages or destroys it because of, of grossly negligent conservation, then, um, then, then you would have it be applicable. Um, but it's an important um, part of the intellectual property law that doesn't get as much attention, I think, as it, as it should necessarily. And part of that is because it does apply to a limited number of, of, and type of work. Uh, but nevertheless, if you, if you are an artist who works uh, in that area, that's something that you're going to want to be able to um, consider in terms of protection for your work. So that will conclude, for now, the copyright and intellectual property discussion. If anybody has any questions, they're welcome to, to share them. But otherwise, um, we can move on now David, to... David, we do have a couple of questions that are coming in um, through oh, sure. the chat while we're still on copyright and intellectual property. The first um, is a question back to the commissioning of a piece of art. Is there standard work for higher language that can be used when you commission a work of art? Uh, yeah, there is. Um, and, and you would want to... Um, that, that would be some, I mean, that'd be a question that I would encourage someone to contact us with directly so that we could provide samples. But yes, you would want to, um, when you're acknowledging something as a work for hire, like I said, you want to have that specific written agreement um, where both parties sign and both parties indicate that uh, the work is considered a work for hire um, and, and that you are not um, an employee um, of the particular person uh, who's hiring or who's having the work done so that there's no question about the absence of an employee-employer relationship. Now, if that relationship exists, then that's a different situation that you'd have to address. But generally, what you'd want to make sure that you specified is, is that you're not an employee of the person, um, that they commissioned the work, that it is, it is a work for hire, um, and that uh, the, the copyright in the agreement or of that particular work is going to belong to the following person. You'd want to specify who owns that particular work. So, but like I said, there would be, you know, on these specific uh, types of, of questions, um, the advice I can give today is, is general advice that is is applicable to most situations. But if someone has an agreement that they're working on, um, they need to get actual specific legal advice you know, from, from someone who knows the facts of their particular situation to make sure that they do have that protection. Okay, and to follow up on that, we had another question that came in, and this might be one that they contact you for later as well. 
Um, but we had an individual artist asking um, if they are seeking publications from their for their work, um, what type of language do they need to include to address things like copyright or usage or payment terms in advance? So uh, can you re can you repeat it again? I'm trying to make sure I understand before I. So if an artist is contacting publishers or um, artists or other scholars um, and they are trying to get their work published or trying to get these scholars to use their work in publications, is so there any like sort of standard language that they should be using to ensure that they're not being taken advantage of when they're sort of trying to shop out their work to people to use it? So this is someone who's, who is doing literary work, is that right? Yeah. It, they would be doing visual artwork and trying to get it, the images used in historical publications or I see. Okay. Literary. Okay. So they have they have created a visual artistic work that they are trying to market in the publishing arena, and yeah. so they would yep. be a part of. They, okay, so they would be that. That's a little bit of a of a specific type of arrangement because. Oftentimes, uh, if you have, let's say, um, a book that is written with an illustrator and a writer, um, then there may be a copyright designation of the work of the two of them combined, that, that they share the copyright in the particular work. Uh, what you would want to do, if you were particularly the, the visual artist in this example, is they would want to reserve the ability to use those images elsewhere so that they are not only granting the right to the image or to the copyright of the image to that particular publisher. So that's essentially what they're doing is they're, they'd be offering a non-exclusive right to that image to that publisher. Um, now, a publisher may want to have an exclusive right. They may want to, um, you know, be the only one who gets to produce it. And while sometimes that seems great because that's someone demonstrating such an interest that they don't want anybody else to have it, um, you're not necessarily required in, in, in the negotiation process to give everything over like that. Um, in fact, I think you'd want to do the opposite. If there's that much interest in it, that would say to me there's value in this particular image. You want to retain the copyright. They can use the image in their publication so long as they give proper acknowledgement of, you know, this work is, you know, the, the, there's a copyright held by this work in this particular artist's name, um, you'd, you would want that recognized so that there's no question as to who the owner and author of that image is. Um, but again, you would want to retain that ability to essentially shop the image or sell the image or use the image elsewhere, including in your own work. I mean, you would not want to have uh, let's say, uh, if, the, if it's an original painting and the person is taking the image of the painting and using it in the book, you would not want to be prevented from using your own painting, which you may still own, uh, and, and, and the image of the painting in a catalog for an exhibition that you're doing at a gallery or at a museum or somewhere else. Otherwise, the person who owns the image, if they buy it outright and they own the copyright, they could come back to you and essentially say, you can't use your image anymore. We bought the copyright for it. You, you have to at, at best license it from us and we're not willing to license it to you. Or, or maybe we are, but we're going to charge an excessive amount of money for it. So I think, uh, I think that might be a good one to, to discuss in more detail um, you know, at another time, but I think that, that at a minimum I want to make sure you, you would uh, make the rights non-exclusive. Okay, great, thanks. Um, to wrap this section up then, one common question we hear, do you need to use the copyright symbol on your artwork or your website? Well, you know, the, the, like I said, because it is a, it's a fixed, um, from the moment you have, have reduced something to a medium, um, you don't, you, you don't really have to because copyright is a fixed. Um, if you want, typically with things like, say, a, a registered trademark symbol or something, which is the R with the circle around it, you need to register that with the trademark office um, in, in order to uh, 
um, have it be registered trademark. Now you can put a TM after it, and that's just an unregistered trademark, um, and and that's okay. You can put the copyright on anything you want. I mean, you, there is nothing that says you can't um, put the copyright symbol on a piece of work um, that you've created. What you'd want to do is you'd want to say, um, you know, the copyright along with the year of the of the first publication of the work, um, and then also the um, the uh, the name of the person who holds the copyright, so that it's clear, you know, that it's copyrighted when it was copyrighted and who has the copyright. So you would, if you're going to use the symbol, it would be best to use it in conjunction with that information. Um, but I don't think it's, you know, necessary. It doesn't hurt. It, it doesn't hurt to put it on it, but I don't. But it's not necessarily required. Okay, great. We will go ahead and move on to the next topic then. And for those of you, if we didn't get to your question, we can um, follow up at the end and get those answered or have David answer them um, after the webinar. Yeah, and I'm happy to answer any. I mean, it, obviously, uh, it's a broad range of topics in an, in an hour. Uh, and so if, we, if people have things that didn't get answered or if my answer wasn't clear or there's something about it that raised another question, just you know, feel free to reach out afterwards and let me know. So the next, uh, I think, is a business organization. Um, and as you can see from the slide there, what are the benefits of organizing as a nonprofit versus other types of for-profit entities? Um, the, it, sometimes when, pe when I have this conversation with people, if, if it's in a group or um, something, I, you hear someone say something to the effect of, well, if you want to make money, form a for-profit. If you don't want to make money, form a non-profit. Um, I think that's a slightly cynical take on it. I don't think it's necessarily true. I think there there is some some truth to it in that if you are in the if if you're interested in opening an art gallery for profit, well then open it for profit. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, if you want to open it as a non-profit gallery, you certainly can. There's also nothing wrong with that. A non nonprofit is a misnomer. When people hear that word and that and that phrase, they oftentimes think that you can't really make money as a nonprofit, and that's not true. A nonprofit can pay good salaries, it can pay good benefits, it can have a huge staff. Uh, all you have to do is think about you know a major museum like the Metropolitan Museum of Art or someplace like that. Their director makes a lot of money, and there are a lot of people on that staff, and they offer good benefits. Um, so. That's a nonprofit institution that's generating a lot of money. Um, so the first important distinction for me is to make sure people don't get caught in that of thinking, well, if it's nonprofit, I can't, I can't make anything. You can, um, but when you become a nonprofit, you introduce a level of accountability um, beyond that of a for-profit business. Certainly, a for-profit business is accountable to its shareholders. It's accountable to its clients. Uh, it's not beyond or, or above uh, any kind of reproach. But with a nonprofit, if it plans on being a tax-exempt organization, and that, that's another misnomer that I want to sort of clarify, um, you have a lot of accountability there. You have accountability from your constituency that you're trying to work for, the donors and the, and the funders that provide your income, uh, the Internal Revenue Service, who's going to pay attention to your activities. Um, you, you have sort of more people there keeping you accountable, and, and that may mean you have more opinions that you have to deal with. Uh, that may mean you have more guidelines and things that you have to, to adhere to with, with funding, particularly that comes from granting bodies or, or, or other nonprofit institutions. So. Um, I think it, it, it's, it's going to be a fact-based question um, in every instance. You're going to have to look at what is the mission of the business, what is the purpose of the business, what do I want to get out of it? And that's going to help to drive whether or not you know, you're a nonprofit or, or a for-profit. Um, the other part about the nonprofits where there's some oftentimes misunderstandings is in the distinction between a nonprofit and a tax-exempt organization. A nonprofit exists at the corporate level, um, which in Iowa is, is handled by the Secretary of State. 
So if you want to form a corporation in Iowa, you do it by drafting articles of incorporation and sending them to the Secretary of State and filing them there. If you then want to become tax exempt, now you switch to the federal level and you have to apply for, apply for what's called um, application for recognition of exemption. Uh, and that is an application that you file with the IRS to get tax exemption. So sometimes there's, a, there's also a misconception whether it's, it's can a nonprofit make money. The other one is, is a nonprofit tax exempt and vice versa. It, it, not every nonprofit will become a tax exempt organization, but every tax exempt organization is some kind of nonprofit. It might be a nonprofit corporation, it might be a trust, it might be an unincorporated association. Doesn't necessarily matter which of those it is, but it's going to have to be one of those in order to get to be tax exempt. So the other the other part of that then would be looking at the tax issue. Um, and, you know, is there an advantage uh, as, you're, as you're looking at the two types uh, of being exempt from federal income tax? Um, when the IRS grants an organization tax exemption, that only means that it's exempt from federal income tax. It may still have to pay property taxes. It may still have to pay sales tax. It may still have to pay a number of other taxes. It doesn't mean it's automatically exempt from everything. Now, typically, a tax-exempt organization, if it owns real estate and it operates its facility or its activities at that real estate, uh, it can apply to the local county or taxing authority for property tax exemption. So when you become tax-exempt, you can become more tax-exempt if, if you're willing to take those steps, but it doesn't automatically mean you never pay a tax again ever. Um, so that's something that, that I think people do need to be aware of when they're looking at which types of those. Are you looking to avoid taxes? Well, if so, you need to know that you have to take some steps to get there. It's not necessarily automatic. Um, so, it, you know, it, there, are, um, there are pros and cons, and it's going to depend on every fact situation. The other thing I think that would be important, particularly with an arts organization, would be if you are not going to generate a fee for service, if your revenue model doesn't include providing something to the community for which you get paid, if you're going to be relying on contributions, if you're going to be relying on granting from, from other nonprofit and tax exempt organizations, it might be a pretty easy decision to be nonprofit and tax exempt. Um, absent a fee for service model where you're going to be able to generate um, revenue for yourself, if you're going to be relying on uh, donations and other means of support, well, then you're going to want to be um, nonprofit and tax exempt because if people are going to make donations to your organization, they're going to want to be able to receive, for the most part, some people will, will do it because they love you and they care about you and they want your organization to succeed and they don't care about the taxes. But for the most part, when someone makes a donation to your organization, they're, they're going to deduct it on their taxes. And they're going to be, at least to some degree, motivated by that tax advantage. Um, so I think if you're looking at that kind of a model where you're saying, I don't know where else I will get money except for the community, except for donors, except for this kind of support, then that might make you seriously question the viability of a for-profit model. So um, again, it'll be, it, it's, it's fact specific, but those are some of the general considerations that I think are important to uh, consider when you're, when you're, when you're of looking at that particular question. Um, okay. It looks like we don't have any questions about this particular topic, so okay. we can go ahead and move on to the next. I know we had quite a few come in um, about liability or whose fault is it. So. Well, I think yeah, we can. Uh, so we so we don't have any on. I had contracts were next. Do so you want to jump over that to liability? Oh, yep, I skipped one slide. Yep, contracts are up next. Okay, and it's actually good because I can, the contract question sort of feeds in with the liability questions, so the two will, it will wind up sort of being a combined answer, I guess, is the short way to say it. So, um, so should, should help to address both those areas. Um, with, with respect to uh, components of a, of a good contract, um, there are some basic requirements that you want to have in any agreement. Now, these are going to vary because you're, you're going to have performance agreements for, say, musical acts or artists that perform that are significantly different from 
a, uh, let's say, a gallery contract where you have work that's on consignment uh, to a gallery for sale or, or a work for hire type of agreement. So there's a lot of variation. One, one contract size does not necessarily fit all. Um, the first rule with any contract is get it in writing. Um, avoid oral agreements at all costs. Um, there's, we always say there's three sides to every story. There's yours, there's theirs, and there's the truth. And, and that's exceedingly true when you talk about an oral agreement because you will remember different things from the other party. You will believe that you are accurate and you will both be wrong. And the term will actually be something quite different that neither of you remembers anymore. And now you're arguing over terms that never existed. It's, it happens all the time with oral agreements and so we really advocate for written agreements, even if it's just a one-page agreement. If it's a very simple relationship between the parties, it's still so much better to reduce it to writing. And the other thing to remember is if you are working with someone who says, well, we don't really need it in writing, you have to ask yourself why. Why don't they want it in writing? If, if they're relying on my friendship and my goodwill because we've known each other for so many years, well, if they're that good of a friend, then it shouldn't be that big of a deal to put it in writing and make sure that everybody's clear about it after the fact. Uh, if it's a new relationship and you don't know the person very well and you don't have a history with them and you haven't established trust with them, you might wonder, well, I don't know them. I don't know, you know what, their, what their background is, what their history is that well. I haven't dealt with them before. I might want to get this in writing. Whatever, whatever the situation, I think it, a, a written written agreement is, is preferable all the time. Um, in addition, uh, under, under state or federal law, depending on what state you're in, um, some contracts have to be written. Um, and that includes contracts for the sale of goods that are valued over $500, um, contracts that can't be performed in one year or less, uh, any agreement that transfers copyright ownership, um, a lease that runs longer than one year needs to be in writing. Um, and in most states, if you have a, a, an agreement where you're leaving uh, a work of art on consignment with, say, a gallery, then, that, then there needs to be a written contract um, for that agreement. Um, the, generally, when you do have a written agreement, you're going to want to have some basic terms. You want to know who's involved. So if it's a person on behalf of an entity. You want to know that they have signing authority for that entity, that they're authorized by its board or its owners or whomever is in control of the organization to actually sign a contract, that they're empowered to do so. Um, you want to have a, a, a date uh, and a term of the agreement. So if the agreement is for a series of performances that are scheduled to occur on specific evenings for a musical act, you want to make sure that you that you identify that specifically. If it's some longer term agreement, you'd want to ha have a clear start and finish to the agreement. Um, the other, and, and these, are, these all seem like they're very obvious, but it's amazing how many times uh, these things fall through the cracks, is you want to have a description of what the service is and, and or what um, products or goods are being sold. Uh, you want to describe exactly what is traveling between the parties. Um, you want to have price that's involved, uh, including whether or not there's a, a payment schedule or any type um, of, of terms for payment. And then both parties need to sign it. Uh, it can't be unsigned uh, by one party. Um, another part of, of this that's important uh, is knowing where disputes will be handled. So let's say, for example, in the case of a musical artist that travels around and performs at, at venues in different states, uh, that particular uh, artist is going to want to have some control over where disputes uh, that arise from that agreement are worked out, what court would have jurisdiction, what law would apply. Um, typically, uh, the law will say wherever the performance occurs, that state will have jurisdiction and that law, state's law will apply. Parties can also contract to say, well, if there's a dispute, we're going to litigate this in Washington, or, or we're, going to, we're going to do it in some other location. When you're looking at those agreements, you want to make sure that you're aware 
what law applies and what state would be in charge of, of deciding a dispute in terms of a court. Um, because if you're required, if you're an artist and, and you're based in Iowa and the agreement says that any disputes will be you know, handled under California law and litigated in California, well, you may not have a high chance of that coming to pass, but you're certainly going to want to know that as one of the terms uh, when, when you're signing the agreement. You just need to be aware that, wow, if this goes badly, I actually have to fly to California if I want to sue this person. And California law will apply. Um, that may put you at a, at a considerable um, disadvantage. Um, the important thing about contract basics to remember is each contract has to have an offer for some kind of service or good. There has to be an acceptance of that offer for services or goods. There has to be cons what we call consideration or payment for that. And there has to be an intent to create a relationship between the parties. If you don't have those things, you don't have a valid contract. Um, so those are sort of the, the important aspects of that to remember. Um, the other part of it is, is going to, and there's a couple of specific questions I can, I can speak to here, and, and certainly if people have others that they'd like addressed, I can speak to those uh, separately. But um, like for example, on the, the, on the slide it says, a presenting organization does not believe a performer met the obligations of the contract. Well, you'd want to be able to provide in, uh, in advance, what does that mean? What is performing the contract? So if, if it's a musical artist and the musical artist is being paid $2,000 to perform at a venue on a particular date, um, let's say the performer cancels uh, one day before because there was a huge snowstorm um, and they can't, they can't drive to the venue or their flight was canceled. Well, in certain situations like that, you'd have what's called a force majeure clause, which basically says that if you fail to show up because of weather or war or um, civil unrest or things like that, um, that you're, neither party is obligated to perform. So if there's a, 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 a tornado in the venue where the artist is supposed to play is destroyed, then neither one is liable for that failure to be able to perform. Um, but on the other side, let's say the, the, the artist just decides that they don't feel like performing or they, they, they are just something came up and they can't make it. Um, you would build in provisions in an agreement where you would give sort of deadlines where you'd say that, um, that let's say the artist can cancel the performance um, in writing uh, with notice to the venue um, no less than 30 days in advance of the performance date without you know, without any penalty, you might want to say if there was a deposit paid that that deposit would be refunded uh, by the performer. Uh, on the other side, if let's say a, a venue cancels a performance less than 30 days or 14 days or something before a particular performance, then the venue would agree to pay the artist a certain percentage of the, of the guarantee if there was a guarantee. Um, and so a big part of, of the liability for these things, and this is what feeds into the liability issue next, is good contract drafting. It, it, and this is why, again, you want it in writing. You want it clear that, okay, if, I, if something changes and I can't make it there, I have until 30 days before that performance or that opening to tell them I can't make it. And if I can't make it, then I have to give them the, the deposit money that they paid me back and I don't get, I'm guaranteed nothing. Um, you need to build in those terms so that they're, first of all, realistic. You wouldn't want someone to be able to cancel three days in advance. That's why you'd want a two-week window or a four-week window so that ideally each party can minimize its damages um, and, and find another performance date or find another venue to perform in um, so that it's not a complete loss for both of the parties. And I think at, at this point we can sort of jump over to uh, on the use of the word loss, we can turn to, turn to the liability section. Um, in, in terms of the, the first question, what's the appropriate level of liability insurance for a small nonprofit? Um, that is, uh, there's, we're one of a number of important people that, that these organizations need to work with. The others are accountants, financial planners, lenders, uh, and insurance agents. 
um, it's always going to be a good idea to consult with your insurance agent before you start changing the types of services you're going to offer or before you start operating as, a, as a, an artist or a nonprofit to understand what type of coverage they think you should have. Now, that said, uh, I, part of the analysis that you'll do whether or not you are talking to your insurance agent yet is, what do we have? What do we need to insure? Um, do we own a building? Okay, yes, we need to insure the building. Uh, what kind of insurance do we want to have on it? Well, you'd want to have general liability insurance on it in case someone slips on the sidewalk and is injured um, walking by the venue or coming to a performance at the venue. Um, you may also want to have an umbrella policy that would backstop those policies in the event of a larger claim or a, or a, a large event where, let's say, five or six people were injured um, at, at a facility. Um, You'd also want to look at, do we have vehicles? Do we have um, equipment that we use on the property that we need to insure? Um, do we have any kind of lifts or anything else that, that might cause harm to somebody that we need to cover? Um, do we have any personal property? What kind of equipment do we have? What fixtures and furniture do we have that we might need to, to insure? So you need to look at what do you have that you need to protect. Um, generally, for a small nonprofit, I would tell you that Again, this is subject to talking to your insurance agent and making sure it's something that you can afford uh, financially. But um, I think a million dollars uh, of coverage is appropriate for these types of things. If you have a larger venue, uh, if you put on more elaborate performances, those types of things, you might want to increase that to two million, five million, something like that. But but typically, I, my guess is, is a million is going to be sufficient coverage. Um, the other thing that you'd want to have is what's called directors and officers insurance, or what we call D&O insurance. Um, this is basically insurance for the organization in the event that someone brings a claim for, say, fiscal mismanagement of the organization or wrongful termination or harassment or something like that. It affords coverage for, your, for the organization and for the directors uh, and officers who may have you know, carried out those decisions or who are ultimately responsible for them. Um, so that's, that's some pretty important insurance to have on top of just, say, the general liability insurance for, for property insurance. Um, as far as who's responsible for liability when multiple partners are involved, this goes back to contracting. Um, this is going to be a, a negotiation or contract issue, um, and you're going to need to determine who's responsible. Now, I don't do personal injury law, so I can speak basically to this, but um, Iowa is generally a, a, is a 51% comparative negligence state, which means that let's say you're one fourth responsible for an accident that you're involved in, and the other party is 75% responsible. Any compensation that you're going to be awarded from the other party, or or what your total damages are, is typically going to be reduced by the percentage that you are responsible for your accident. Now, if you go over 50% and you're, you're greater than that amount responsible for your own accident, then typically you're going to be denied compensation for it. Um, so on the, on the back end, the worst case scenario, when something's already happened, that's how that's going to break down. But the best way to do that and the way that I think you'll find it, most organizations are going to face it is um, through the negotiation process, through the contract drafting process that happens before an event, um, typically a host is going to try to minimize their liability. Um, they're going to want participants to provide proof of insurance, uh, or they're otherwise going to limit their liability contractually. So like if you're at, a let's say, an art fest somewhere, there's probably going to be some kind of liability provision that says that as a vendor at this event, you accept full responsibility for all liability, all damages that happen to people or property. So to the question of, of what happens if an artwork is damaged in an event, this would exclude that and say, we're not responsible for it. None of our employees are responsible for it. None of our volunteers. You all sign a participation agreement that says that you agree to indemnify us and hold us harmless from any claims or actions or suits or anything that arises uh, during this particular event. So typically they're going to try to say, we're not liable if somebody gets hurt. If somebody gets hurt, if you get hurt here, you're assuming responsibility, you're assuming the loss, 
you can't bring that back on us. Um, so to the question of when does a nonprofit need to include indemnification, the answer is going to be always. Um, you always want to have in an agreement if something is damaged or someone is hurt or property is hurt, who's responsible for it. Um, oftentimes, if say it's a delivery of an artwork, the artist will be responsible for delivering it to the property and any damage that occurs prior to that point will be the responsibility of the artist. Once it arrives on the premises and becomes the property of say um, the owner, if, if it's being sold, um, then typically you'd have the responsibility fall there. Other way, otherwise, if you have, say, a consignment, you need to work out specifically in the particular state you're in, dealing with the person that you're dealing with, who's responsible for it if it's on consignment, um, if it's damaged. Um, so, and I think the last, I think I'm getting close to my time here, um, the last issue is taxes. Uh, and and the, the one question that was posted before was, how are grant funds reported on, on taxes for artists or for nonprofits? Um, for, an, for an artist, according to the IRS, if you get a scholarship or a fellowship grant of some kind, uh, it's generally tax-free only if you're a, a candidate for a degree at an eligible educational institution. Um, if your only income is a, a completely tax-free scholarship or a fellowship, you don't have to file a tax return. No, no reporting is, is necessary. If you are not uh, a candidate for a degree at that type of institution, um, uh, it's tax-free only to the extent that it doesn't exceed your qualified education expenses. It isn't designated or earmarked for things like room and board, um, and it doesn't require, uh, or sorry, it doesn't represent payment for teaching. So it can't be a payment for services like a TA agreement, that type of thing. Um, so if it meets those requirements, it's generally considered to be tax-free. Uh, if it doesn't meet them, then it was, it's generally going to be considered taxable by the IRS, and it has to be included in your gross income um, and would have to be reported on, on your tax return, whether you file 1040 or 1040EZ or whatever. Um, for a, a nonprofit, a grant is generally going to be reportable on that organization's Form 990, which it has to file every year with the IRS. Um, unless you file the Form 990-N, which is the one for the very smallest organizations that have the least amount of income, those typically just ask you if you've exceeded $50,000 in gross revenues. If you haven't, then you don't report specifics. Um, but anybody who's above that threshold is typically going to have to report that grant income at, as just income on their 990, but it's not taxable because if you're filing a Form 990, you're a tax-exempt organization, so you're not subject to federal income tax on the income that you generate. So, so I think I ran a little bit over, but uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, you're welcome to, to type them on the, on the uh, chat box on the screen. You're also welcome to uh, send them directly to me by email, or you certainly give me a call. Um, if, you if you work with a lawyer currently, uh, and, and you want to discuss this with their with them, uh, and they have a question for me, by all means, have have them give me a call. I'm always happy to to help out, whether it's directly with somebody or if it's through their existing counsel. So, uh, I'm sorry I ran a few minutes over. Like I said, it's a lot to di to discuss in an hour. Hopefully, it was uh, beneficial to you. And uh, um, I'll turn it over to you guys, and we can go from there. Great, David, thank you so much for, for uh, taking time to chat with us today. One last thing in closing, um, if you could, again, um, just briefly recap the services available for volunteer lawyer, uh, lawyers for the arts and the best way for people to um, access those services. Sure. Uh, the, 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 the main services that we're offering right now is where we are providing educational uh, events like this where we participate in these types of events and try to uh, educate uh, artists and arts organizations in the state about general legal issues, general legal situations. Uh, we're going to be supplementing uh, our, our, these types of presentations with publications that summarize uh, these same types of things that will be available on our website. Probably uh, the student interns that we have from the law school are working on them this semester, so I would imagine uh, by summer those should be up. Um, and, and we also offer uh, referral services to um, attorneys in the state 
uh, who can provide pro bono legal services to artists and arts organizations uh, that find they have specific situations that they need help with uh, beyond, say, the general situation where we can help educate people. So if people had questions or needs, uh, they could contact uh, me through the website. Um, and if it's something that I, I handle, then I handle it with them directly. If it's something like, say, a specific intellectual property question that's better suited for an intellectual property uh, practitioner, uh, then we uh, try to get that person connected with somebody in the state who's hopefully conveniently located to them, available to them, um, and that has the uh, expertise that they need, and that person then uh, coordinates and, and helps them to deal with their specific issue. Excellent. Thank you so much once again, David. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me. And thanks, everyone, for joining us on the webinar today. Um, as we mentioned earlier, we'll be sending out a recording of today's conversation along with David's contact information um, here in just a little bit. We'll also include a brief survey in that email. So please feel free to fill, fill, please, excuse me, please do fill that out and let us know what you think about today's webinar. That gives us an opportunity to tell what types of RDUPS you would need uh, in the future. We would also like to invite those of you on the webinar today to join us for upcoming Art Ups this month. In honor of tax season, we will be hosting an in-person workshop called Record Keeping for Artists with Springboard for the Arts on February 13th here in Des Moines. And we will be hosting another webinar next Thursday, February 11th for nonprofits called Expanding Your Reach, Engaging Your Board with Lori Jacob with of Ignited Fundraising. So please join us for one or both of these webinars in February. You can find registration information on our website at www.iowaartscouncil.org. Uh, thanks again to David Bright for joining us today, and thanks to everyone who joined us um, calling in and online. Thank you. Thanks. Goodbye.